We are back. After a short hiatus, it's time for another Formula Forza pre-race podcast by Jet Motorsport. I'm your host, Ryan McDowell, Gamertag Siphon68. And I am Derek James, Gamertag Magnum278. And I am Brad James, Gamertag Winner J. And I'm your special guest for tonight, co-founder of LBM Motorsports and the head administrator for the series, Kyle Litherland, BTR Villeneuve, uh, formerly known as Clement E. Lith. Right, so we are right on the verge of entering qualifying for the Florida GP at the Sebring International Circuit. Before we get to that, let's go back three weeks and talk about the Atlantic GP at Road Atlanta. Holy cow, what a race. So we had the closest qualifying across the board that Formula Forza has ever had. We had Lobby A from 1st to 15th separated by just 1.1 seconds, and you had Group B right on the heels of that only separated by 1.2 seconds across the entire field. That's insane. You look at Group A from about, what is that, 4th to, I guess it's it's 5th to 14th or so, just like 3 tenths. I mean, that's insane that that it it really has gotten that close. And it it really, you know, at one point in late day 3, Uh, The gap between first and second, and I know that not everybody can see it because the times are hidden on the website, but at one point, we were looking at uh, Alex P. with a 105.478, and Bulin Wall had a 105.481. Yes, three thousandths of a second would have separated the pole position uh, had Bulin Wall not gone through with a 105.421 that we know he did. Um, Getting to the race itself... Uh, we saw the Bullen Wall just sort of convert that pole straight into a win. Alex P. not far behind him. Um, and he Bullen Wall also picks up the, the wild card of the, of the event, which is fastest certified lap with a 105.415. Actually went faster than his qualifying time, just by, you know, smidgens here. We're, we're talking thousands, uh, six thousandths of a second faster he went in the race. Um but yeah, Alex P. then picked up second place. Drake Hellspawn finishes out the podium just barely ahead of uh, FMS Senna in fourth. Um, we had no no notable wrecks, no retirements in Group A. Uh, we did have TLR Eclipse first to lag out in Group A, taking the um, 27th position overall. Uh, XPR Overdrive from Serpent Racing. Uh, lagged out and took 26th place overall. BTR Blazon from Katrim R1 uh, ended up lagging out as well and took 25th place overall. Brad, do you want to you want to give us a quick rundown of what happened in Group B's race? Giant Two Shoes just basically running the race right straight from the start, uh, straight to the finish he won. And um, there were a couple forced retirements that of uh, CD195 and. James Hall 94, but other than that, it was pretty clean. It was a good race. It was fun to watch. You know, other than my slide off in the first, or in a turn two. Yeah, well. Yeah, well, I, like, partially other involved. than the first lap, it was honestly, not going to lie, kind of boring. Really? Because what's, what's insane is you look at the results from it, and if it was boring, the results don't show it because the, the intervals between drivers finishing, you look at, at uh, second place was seven seconds behind first. Okay, that's a bit of a gap. Then you got three seconds behind that, nine seconds behind that, 16 seconds behind that, six seconds, 33, and then you got one second right behind that. Uh, Derek, one second behind Pipin269, which is uh, Kyle's, Kyle's partner in R1. Uh, so, yeah. One second behind Lucas there. I mean, how was your race, Derek? Um, other than a slide off, cresting the hill at turn two and hitting the wall, in on the first lap, and getting some damage actually. from that. Yeah, whatever. But um, it was it was mostly the, all the position changes were due to pit stops. There wasn't much uh, passing really, like uh, pound for pound, just coming up and overtaking the guy was more of when the when the guy in front of you went into the pits you ended up overtaking him and yeah the results were close with the exception of pretty with i believe the last lap there wasn't that much overtaking it was pretty much all cycling through pit stops that caused uh changes in position you know honestly i i did not expect the results to be this close at the uh at the finish of the race 
looking at, at Group B, I really did not expect this to be a very close race. Even though the lap times are very short here, these are the lowest lap times we have on the entire calendar, but uh, Road Atlanta is a ridiculously hard track to pass at. You know, you, it, basically all the overtaking has to happen due to mistakes. And if you do get a race going like Drake Hellspawn and FMS Senna, it's kind of a rare thing. So, you know, to hear that most of the passing happened due to pit strategy or or mistakes that were made or retirements uh, not a huge shock to me you know uh, we'll see a lot of action i think at uh, at sebring this weekend what do you guys think oh yeah you that's probably it's one of the best tracks on the calendar in my opinion it's it's got everything it's got medium speed very tight corners it's got you know drop it all the way down from top speed to first gear hairpin corners it's got lots of passing zones you, it may not look like it but at the end of pretty much every straight or short straight there is an area to pass with the exception of maybe the beginning of the third sector most of the track are able to pass at with the exception yeah the third sector right at the beginning and then the uh turns two through four because that's just a very tight section the, the road gets very narrow there but it's very quick lap times, very high speeds, and it's a very fun track. And, and it it has it all. Like it, like like Derek said, uh, the track has a very for a, a lot of variety within like the corners and the straights and this stuff. So then you'll see a variety of setups. So then you'll have full downforce setups. You'll have like no downforce setups, and then it'll be a good race because there'll be differences. Like the low downforce cars will pass the high downforce cars on the straights and then the high downforce cars will catch up in the corners so it'll be a good race yeah yeah so let's before we we go on to that we're still on the atlantic gp kyle let's get your thoughts on the race uh you started eighth in group a and worked your way up to six what do you think of, the, of uh the race at road atlanta well <laughs> i don't really know where i could begin uh there was so much going on at all times and you know it just it's it's just, it's just a game it was a race of concentration and just knowing what's going on like you said, it's so hard to overtake uh, Road Atlanta, and um, I believe I got quite the poor start down into twelfth, uh, I believe, and then you know I got a bit of help from a couple of leg outs and uh, getting some overtakes afterwards. I think um, the whole second half of the race, the last twenty-five laps, I was always within a few hundred feet of um, I was an XPR Roadrunner and XPR Aggie. Uh, the whole last twenty-five laps, so. Though it is a really tough place to pass, so you can always stay really tight with the guys in front and behind you. And I thought it was a great, I thought it was a great race, and I thought it had a lot of action in it, really. Especially the battles up front, Alex and Bolin, especially Drake and Senna. I mean, it just shows you know, the great drivers in this year, and um, you know just how good you ha have to be to compete up there too. Yeah, that's. I heard more of that from the other uh, Group A drivers. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make the race. I was on vacation during the race, so I had to like sit there and just, you know, I'm trying to imagine what's going on in the race. I really wish I could have been there to watch that um, unfold. But, you know, I heard from from several people, uh, XPR Roadrunner included, uh, that that it really was a great race, and that had some of the some of the better action. I heard that from Overtake as well. Uh, from AVR, uh, he said it was it was a great race, and I was like, "Good God, I'm gonna have to go on vacation more often for having races this good." <laughs> so uh, before we we uh, move on to our our next our next topic, uh, Brad, you want to give us the a quick rundown of the standings after the Atlantic GP, where we stand right now? Yeah, I'm just gonna do the uh, top ten, and then uh, any other things that stand out here. Um, just. Uh, tied for first, actually, is uh, Alex P. and Bullenwall, each with 205 points. Then we got XPR Roadrunner, uh, four points ahead of XPR Eggy. And then we got um, BTR Villeneuve, which is uh, you, Kyle. And then we have Bloody Kane, two, two points ahead of uh, Overtake. Johnny Two Shoes, tied with FFS Senna. And then in 11th, but I guess you could say technically in 10th, is uh, Overtake. One point behind uh, Senna and Johnny Two Shoes. Bloody Kane there was actually two points ahead of Drake Hellspawn, who is then five points ahead of Overdrive, not Overtake. So what about the team? Um, first place is, uh, no surprise here, is um, Aces Wild. And in second is Penzoil's Zextel passing Serpent Racing. 
and actually, uh, Azwap passed up racing too, and then we got XBR, Eggy Dog Biscuits, and then LOBM R1. LBM really sitting consistent points there. Uh, 76 points last race set their season best already. I mean, only two races in, but season best at 83 points, bringing them up to 159 points, uh, less than 10 points behind nearest rival XBR. So that'd be kind of interesting to see how that uh, shapes up the battle for, for third and fourth uh, in in the top five payable, payable spots there. Uh, really interesting, right at the top, there's honestly only six points separates Aces Wild Motorsports from Pennzoil's Exel. Everybody knew it be, would be really close, um, but you know, man, I I don't know that I knew it would be quite this close. Two races in, I figured we, especially with FMS Senna's uh, retirement from Suzuka, I figured that would really hurt Pennzoil's Exel for much longer than just. Uh, the one race it did, but Penzoil's Exel, right? Exactly one race. Penzoil's Exel sets the uh, the season record at at, at uh, Road Atlanta, 188 points. Uh, the, that's some phenomenal points for them. You know how in the uh, the first podcast, our uh, we were trying to pick out our dark horse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right out of the gate, Serpent Racing became the dark horse. They got that Ferrari. That's kind of a. Uh, it's not the the uber quick car, but it's not slow. It's the car that they worked with. They tuned it to the best that they could do it, and they're sitting pretty in third place right now. I mean, that's amazing for them to just. Uh, I mean, it's really a, a testament to their drivers, XPR Roadrunner and uh, XPR Overdrive. I mean, Overdrive, that's his car. It's tailored to him. He drove it last year. He knows it well, and it's really showing his experience in that Ferrari. No surprise, I think it's uh, Eggy Dog Biscuits in fourth. I never. Ex- I never expected them to be in fourth. There's some fast guys, though. You know, I mean, I I don't. What's your What's your take on this, Kyle? What, what's the big surprise? Only two races in, so we got a lot of the season to go. What's your big surprise of of the standings right now, driver or team? Well, I could I would probably agree with Brad there on uh, XBR Aggie Dog Biscuits, but then you just you look at the driver lineup and you think it's almost the understatement of the year. I mean, Aggie and Mad Dog are some brilliant drivers and. Uh, it showed they have taken an Aston Lola and driven it with with the big boys, and they really perform. And I I really think that they're the team to watch out for this year. Another thing that is actually really surprising would be both of the Audi teams in sixth and seventh. What? Yeah, yeah no doubt. I remember in Suzuka just listening to them during the race, like, "Oh, I hate this car," rah, rah, like all this stuff, and then sixth and seventh. In, another thing, in one race. Yeah, and Ow. AVR, 92 points. I mean, if they keep that up, they're going to be working into uh, into the money, top five. Uh, I mean, at the right tracks, they can really do some damage. And I'm, Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic GP really did favor the Audis, but we'll have to see what happens there. I mean, Rising Sun scored, uh, you know, very good points at, at the Japanese GP, not so... I mean, 10 points less at the Atlantic GP versus 92 points from AVR at uh, at Road Atlanta. So, you know, we'll have to see how that plays out. 11 th- point, wait. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, they're not 11. They're, uh, they're uh, four points apart. 20, 23 points. 23 points from LLBM. So there is a bit of a gap there. But, you know, things can happen throughout the season if drivers miss races or you get reserve drivers come in and don't do as well as their counterparts who are used to this and have been in here for seasons and seasons. Then, you know, this this really do, does become a race. I, You know, I, I think the biggest surprise for me was not XBR because I saw them in the, um, the preseason, not really – winter tests but the the preseason just kind of in lobbies and stuff and man they were quick i i even talked to him and i said hey why not the amr1 why the why the aston lola and they said you know we we think we stand actually a really good chance with this thing and then they were actually put able to put down the times to do that so it was really surprising to see that happen uh but serpent racing not that i expected anything less from a pair up of um xpr Overdrive and, and XPR Roadrunner, but you know, wow, to see that happen, um, you know, they were kind of middle to, I guess, about a two-third pick in the draft, and so I, I, that's kind of where I was expecting them to land. But it's, you know, the draft has really worked, I think, 
uh, in the favor of the league of making everything close. And if, if anything goes to, to show that, it's how close the qualifying was at the Atlantic GP. To move on, let's go ahead and go to uh, Kyle's series, LLBM, our partners. Um, let's just talk about the last two races. Kyle, you want to you wanna take it over and talk about, uh, about the last two races? Sure thing. Um, <laughs> there have been some uh, brilliant races uh, lately. Um, recently, we've been to uh, Road America for our Road Race Showcase. Um, well, that was that was full of action. Um, I think because it's such a it's such a long track, it pretty the other ones we've been to so far. Uh, it was the first time we really saw the uh, the LMPs ones uh, spread out. Um, you know, BTR Blazing won that race overall and just won it outright. Um, uh, myself, along with uh, the other drivers, such as MXR Relentless, um, they had just been hit with some bad damage. Paladin, of course, uh, lagged out of that race, unfortunately, which uh, really hurt the Muscle Milk uh, Team Neon team. Um, the Road America race, though, I have to say, was <laughs> definitely one of the most interesting races. Um, we saw quite the incident in GT late in the race with uh, Explosive Sam and BTR Raikkonen, who was formerly uh, Pipe and 69, my teammate in Formula Forza, um, he got into uh, quite the wreckage, just a few laps to go, and uh, just shows, you know, it's it's such a tough track to tame, as as fun as it is, it's really tough to tame, and it just makes for really great racing and that the great battles we saw, unfortunately, the uh, the retirements, but um, that was such a great race and uh, Magnum, Derek, I know um, you were got the best perspective from LMPC and GTC. You want to take us through the Road Race Showcase at Road America from uh, the Challenge Lobby? Yeah. Um, the the setups were the thing that impacted me the most this track. I mean, it, like you said, it's a very tough track to tame. You got the, uh, the carousel, which, you know, on the track map is two separate corners. It's such a long corner. And if you go with a no downforce setup, you're way off the gas there. So it's really a balance. It's like do I go with at least some downforce and lose some speed on the straightaways just to be able to make those the long corners in the carousel, or do I go no downforce and just lose speed in the carousel in the slow corners? And it seemed like most of the guys, LMPC and in GTC, both ran no downforce or nearly no downforce setups. I mean, Bull and Wall, I know the Flying Lizard guys ran no downforce. The... Uh, RDT2 guys didn't run any downforce, neither did TLR Eclipse. I myself ran a little bit because I, I at least prefer, you know, some stability to the car because the Porsche is such a, a tough car to tame. And it it's uh, very interesting to try and make a setup for that car. And same with LMPC. All those guys were running no downforce setups, you know, with the exception of Brad who came in late and didn't end up getting a setup ready for the weekend but everybody else ran low down lower no downforce so i mean it really showed in the speed and the other uh, points the uh the challenge cars were near were hitting uh high 190s on the straightaway and the uh the gtc cars were getting up into the 60s and 70s at the end of the straightaway and it, it just shows the the time and effort that people put into it but the race itself was very interesting there was uh a few changes in position in lmpc both due to pit stops and uh just due to natural overtaking during the race, but GTC stayed pretty much the same, um, with the exception of me, myself, and James Hall. We both had some slide offs and some uh, some issues during the race, dropping us further down the list. But we ended up battling, and the uh, the the uh, the actual order of the race turned out in LMPC. The podium: Drake Hellspawn for Aces Wild in uh in first not surprisingly ryan siphon 68 for jet creator i'm close behind in second and then adam watson for awr racing um in third place and then gtc finished off with bull and wall in first for flying lizard tlr eclipse for tech life racing in second and terminator for rd2 in third um kyle how about uh atlanta how did that turn out well actually can i say something quick about um about uh uh, Road America. The best thing the best ever thing. is uh, going around the outside of the carousel, around like a, a challenge uh, a GT car. Like I don't know why that's just like it's so cool to just like toss it in and like zoom around the outside and pass it uh, another car. I, 
because I've never you can't really do that in R1 because of the similar speeds of the cars but you know, that's, a, that's, that's awesome I never expected something like that to be as, as cool as it is yeah and some of just the partial that thrill of being you know in one of the faster classes I mean just getting that thrill of overtaking a car like that on the outside it just it must feel great you know I know I'm in the challenge lobby I watching the races um from Siphon 68's perspective, uh, you know, it just the, the racing down the Challenge Lobby is phenomenal, and the, that classes, the two classes have really flourished in their in their debut year. So we're all really excited to see that. I would say, especially the competitors in that class. Um, as we move on to uh, Road Atlanta, uh, <laughs> that was another interesting one. Um, our Petit Le Mans race. Um, there's there were so many. Um, points that happened in the LMP1 at GT lobby. Um, of course, there was a uh, second race for uh, GT driver SpongeBob 186, um, and there was a there was a bit of commotion that he caused. But um, you know, he was working well. I th I thought in his debut, um, but the debut that really marked uh, the debut of debuts, I would say, the star debut was X. In flames and BTR Snakey, uh, the brand new team for Toro Rosso Racing. Um, it doesn't seem like a junior team, like the name would say. Uh, these are two leaderboard drivers, as you know. X and Flames is second in R1 leaderboards. I, I, I don't even know how you can be that good. It's you know, it's freakishly out of this world, you know, alien good. Um, he um, he basically took off with the win at Road Atlanta. Flames. This kind of left all the prototypes in the dust. Uh, BTR Blazing was keeping up for the longest time until he got into it with one of the GT cars, uh, but he took second. I myself, uh, BTR Vilna, was sitting third in a great battle with uh, debutante BTR Snakey. Um, when I sustained probably the uh, most spectacular crash of the year um, uh, involving another GT car, unfortunately, which is <laughs> the one. Uh, problem that you gotta watch out for and you gotta be aware of when uh, prototypes are passing GTs, especially in Road Atlanta down that straightaway where you're just flat out for a very, very long time, almost half the racetrack. Um, I got sent on about four nice uh, rollovers. It was quite the adventure. Um, so I, of course, DNF'd from that. Snakey, on his debut, unfortunately lagged out, but uh, CP Skate rounded off uh, the podium in third place, so that was a second and third for Red Bull Racing, which really helped them in the team championship standings, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, GT podium. Um, the winner of that race was IX Overtake XI, who took the win in an amazing last lap battle with uh, Johan1138 of Reddit Racing. They had a battle the whole, whole race. It was quite phenomenal, even through the pit stops. They were just always right together. Overtake took the win eventually over uh, Johan's Jaguar. And another Jaguar on the podium was Explosive Sam. His first uh, career podium for Precision Engineering. Oh, but overall, even with the incidents, I thought it was a great race in the LMP1 and GT lobby. And uh, I understand that there was another brilliant race in the Challenge lobby. So I'll take it over to Derek. Yeah, um, the Challenge lobby... Uh, was very interesting on the LMPC side because there were two very prominent battles during that race. Cookie Monster and Siphon 68 each exchanged positions a few times through natural overtaking and ended up exchanging positions through pit stops and then after that again for just straight driving. And they were pretty much glued to each other's bumpers for most of the race. And then the same deal goes for Fractal 13 and Adam Watson. They kind of came together later in the race after the pit stop shuffled out. But they stayed together for a good 10 laps, bumper to bumper, just driving their butts off, trying to uh, race for that final spot on the podium. And in GTC, there really wasn't much action. It was Everybody was kind of off on their own race after about 10 laps. Um two things in both classes we had an unclassified driver last week meaning that somebody came in wanted to drive for the week didn't have a team wasn't officially signed up but they came in and did, just wanted to get in a get an idea of what the series would be like that was TLR Speedstar in LMPC and Vin Doctor 21 in GTC 
Um, they both came in, agreed to concede to traffic, whether or not they were behind them or not, because they technically weren't in weren't in the the race per se. They weren't challenging for points, but they uh, they ended up giving it a good run. They both, you know, even though they really weren't supposed to race with anybody, they both got into some battles with some people and had some good runs going. But the results at the end of the race turned out in an LMPC, the podium, Cookie Monster, at the end of the race, after all that battling, got the win over Siphon 68 in second, and Fractal 13 took third after Adam Watson had a, a brief scrape with the wall in the first corner and gave him just enough damage to slow him down for Fractal to get away. And in GTC, the chief champagne sprayer was Addy for RD2 Racing, who wins his first race of the year, taking taking a win away from Bull and Wall for the first time this year. He did qualify first, but did not win. He ended up finishing second. And then in third, rounding out the podium at GTC, was the Dynamic Uno. Holy crap, this battle with Cookie Monster. We gotta talk about it. Cookie Monster running a low downforce setup on Road Atlanta. That's kind of the obvious thing to do, and that's that's what I qualified on. I qualified... Um, Third, actually, Drake Hellspawn uh, achieved pole, but uh, wasn't there on the race day, so Cookie Monster inherited the pole. Um, but third overall, just two tenths behind Cookie Monster. And then after qualifying closed, but before the race, I was playing with the tune, seeing if I could extract anything more out of it so I could be more competitive on race day. And I went from a 113.8 to a 113.3 in the matter of a day by going to full downforce. I, I, and I could do it almost lap after lap after lap. And so I was like, well, good Lord, you know, I'm going to have to run the race this way, full downforce. I mean, why wouldn't you? You get more maneuverability to round the, the GTC cars. Uh, you know, on the, on the back stretch, if I get stuck behind somebody, I can just use them to draft, and my high downforce shouldn't, shouldn't affect me too much. Uh, the thing I had to be sure of is that if I got ahead of Cookie Monster, I'd have to get well clear of Cookie Monster so that he couldn't just pull draft and we were trading positions the whole race. And at the beginning of the race, Cookie Monster stalls on the line. The past several races have kind of plagued Cookie Monster. His wheel has been cutting out on him uh, mid-race. So at the Road Atlanta, or uh, I'm sorry, at the uh, Road America... Uh, race, his his wheel cut out on him just as I caught up to him. I was looking forward to a good battle there. Wheel cut out on him. So I immediately inherited uh, his position at Road America. So I'm looking I'm looking for it here. And the same thing happened to him at Mazda. Uh, wheel just went out and he went flying off track. Um, so by the time we get here, he stalls on the line. And, you know, the, the video is now up. It just got up uh, just a little bit earlier today. You can go out there and take a look at this. Um, it, I I get the jump on him off the line. He falls back several positions. I'm like, oh, yes, this is working. So I, I maintain a, a, good, a good lead until I see him start moving up through the pack, you know, and, and due to sticking behind uh, lap traffic and, and – trying to be as, as conservative as I, as I can. I don't want to get in a wreck with a GTC car and just, you know, give it away. So, you know, I'm giving room. I'm not being real aggressive with trying to pass GTC drivers. And suddenly he's 400 feet behind me. And that's 200 feet out of a draft zone. As soon as you get within 200 feet, you can start drafting on the straights. So I was like, oh, God, you know, I'm going to have to pull this out. And uh, then I come up no fault of, of Dynamic Uno. I made the wrong call. I went to the inside, turn three, and just no traction at all, go off, and now Cookie Monster is right on me as soon as I get back on track. So it wasn't long after that. He passes me, and then it, it turns out uh, about lap 29, I have now closed the gap to him, and he's running low downforce, I'm running high downforce, and what's crazy is you get these like gaps that will form because his... Uh, his low downforce allows him to achieve much higher top end on the back straight. My high downforce means that I can take basically the first and second sector, you know, practically flat out, and I'll gain back all the speed, notably turn five, turn one, and 
uh, turn three. I can I can take considerably faster, and you see it in the in the video that I I make up a lot of ground in those zones, but then can't do anything on the you know seven to ten turn seven to d turn ten. I can't do anything to defend against Cookie Monster's low down force, and then it, it just extends. It's almost like a dual DRS zone for the start finish straight. He's just got the legs on me there. So finally it works out that either lap traffic or something holds him up. Lap 29, I am basically hooked to his bumper. Not even, I mean, the distance from the, his rear diffuser and my front splitter, maybe six inches at one point. I actually had to lift on the back straight because I was catching his draft. Uh, what an amazing race. It comes down, culmination, last four laps. I actually do get ahead of him. And then into uh, turn 10B which is the right-hander in the chicane at the end of the straight. Um, I slide over to the side. He wasn't anticipating it. We get a bit of a bump there. Still still clean, nothing, uh, no no negligence there, but Cookie Monster retains retains his position ahead of me. But wow, what a great w race. We finish uh, less than one second apart. Same for Fractal and Adam Watson, finished uh, just over a second apart from each other. But wow. Best race I've had in LLBM yet, and the races I've had before uh, were also quite good, so that's really saying something. Brad, you have the community news section, and you're going to start us off with some auto show news. All right. Yeah, um, I, uh, a couple Wednesdays ago, had the privilege of uh, going to the uh, Detroit Auto Show, lucky me, and um, if you haven't been on like websites such as Road Track or Car Driver. There were some uh, interesting things there. Uh, probably the main talking point of the sh the auto show was the uh, 2014 Corvette Stingray. Uh, there were two of them there. There was a one in a turntable, and then <laughs> there was one on the wall, like it was just hanging on the walls. It was uh, actually kind of funny. But uh, anyways, other than that, there was the uh, NSX uh, concept was there. It was ac it's actually a hybrid. I didn't know that before how, then, but that's kind of cool. How good looking is it? Uh, let's just say I looked at it for around 15 minutes straight. <laughs> um, also, there was this uh, awesome new little uh, electric Honda they had there called the uh, EV Stir. It's it's basically. A go kart that's electric, that's road legal. It's it's tiny. It's like three feet tall. It's ridiculous. And um, the uh, they had a uh, Mercedes SLS AMG Black Edition there, uh, which I wasn't aware of until after I left. Um, that was actually cool. They had um, many Porsches. Actually, they had the debut of the uh, brand new uh, Maserati Quattroporte there looks awesome it's more square and edgy now than it uh, was in the past which is odd because um, Maseratis are usually edgy especially around the um, grill area um, what else uh, before we uh, differences how was the Corvette after looking into photos how different was it when you finally got to see it in person um when I did get to see it in person, I was actually surprised at how small it actually is. Even though it, it looks small, even though it is wider than the previous Corvette, it just looks tiny. I like it's kinda hard to describe. Like the way it like um basically like, squeezes in, in in the rear. Cause it, it, it starts out in the front pretty wide and then it gets smaller as it goes back to the uh, rear of the car. And it just looks small. It's it's short. It's really tight on the inside, which is one of my problems with it. There's like no room in the inside at all. Other than that, it it like in the like when I first saw the pictures, like oh, it's kind of ugly. But I have no problem with the rear end now. It actually looks kind of cool when you see it in person. It's it's better than it looks in pictures. So if you ever if you ever had the chance to like go to an auto show, maybe the Chicago auto show coming up to see it highly recommend going to see just to see the Corvette like it's awesome moving on for Brad and mine we picked our favorite YouTube video of this week and it was the premiere of Mighty Car Mods season 5 if you haven't watched it it is two 
Australian guys who that just go through and they show you detail by detail how to do certain mods to your cars, like how to add an electric push to start button, or how to take out your radio and replace it with an iPad, or how to take a really crappy car, make it look even more crappy, but give it more swag. And these two <laughs> dudes, Moog and Marty, are some of the funniest dudes ever. I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch. The, uh, the Actually, the first episode, the whole content of it is they bought a... Nissan S13 240SX SE and the guy Marty who is normally partial yeah it is a 180 sorry that's not it's not in the US but uh, the guy Marty who is very partial to Subarus one condition had to get rid of all of his Subarus and that 180SX is now his car pretty much they spent the whole first episode apparently the engine was blown it had an SR20 from an S14 in it and they took the all the ignition stuff out and did compression tests on the motor and all the cylinders seemed fine and then they took all the turbo bits off and checked all that and nothing was wrong pretty much they uh... they just recharged the battery and the car started right up but they actually determined the problem with the car was that they uh... the alternator was bad so and it wasn't charging the battery properly so after a while the car would run and then it would slowly just die and they paid, I believe it was under two grand for the car, because apparently, according to the guy, the motor was quote unquote blown and it wasn't working. And the whole premise of this car is it's their new project car. They're trying to uh, turn it into a drifter, and that's pretty cool. That sounds pretty sweet. We will uh, we'll we'll actually link that in the description for this video. We'll we'll link to that that uh, YouTube video. So if you if you this sounds like something you want to watch, you just follow the link and uh, you go right over there yeah moving on Sebring predictions gentlemen what do you guys think will happen next week down in Florida good god yes I think this is going to be an excellent race I think qualifying won't be quite as close as Road Atlanta because there's not as many tricky corners uh, at, at Road Atlanta there was almost nothing to mess up there I mean you got 12 turns total and really only a couple that is feasibly possible for you to mess up at Sebring this starts bending the line of of technical versus uh, traditional track uh, you've got there's no camber to the course at all it is totally flat which means you're gonna see for the guys that are really big tuners you're gonna see um, some tunes that will take advantage of that by messing with their differential or uh, perhaps messing with the brake biases, things that they wouldn't do on uh, tracks like Road America, for example, that has a lot of camber in the corners, so you can do things with the tune that help take take advantage of that. Um, but it, you look at, at turn one, real tricky, and if you get it right, huge lumps of time off. Turn seven, if you get it right, huge lumps of time off. Turn ten, if you get it wrong, costs you a lot. I mean, there's not really a great way to take turn 10, but if you get it wrong, it costs you a ton of time. Um, same thing with turn 13. You go a little bit too wide, you hit the, the rumble strip, they'll pop you up in the air. Could even cause damage there. It's like a weird rumble strip. Acts like there's a small ramp in the middle of it. Um, you go to turn 16. If you don't get the exit from turn 16 right, you're screwed for that whole straight and turn 17 probably the trickiest turn on the entire track and there's there's some really interesting lines through turn 17 and there's no one right way to take it but there are certainly some some that uh, have have proven more effective than others you just got to be really worried about the the barriers on the, the left side bits. as you exit yeah yeah the bumpy bits too they'll send you right into those tire walls and that will end a race that's the interesting thing about that corner you could go, you can kind of swing it wide, avoid the bumpy bits in the middle, but you will lose time because it takes longer to swing the car around and get it out. Or you could slow down and hug that inside retaining wall and almost hug the pit entrance, but you will get a lot of bumps. And even if you go in the middle, it could bump and wash the car out wide. Same thing with turn one. We had problems in LOBM with the Porsches. If you ran too springy of a spring setup, you, uh, it would actually, the front of the car would wash out and send you wide off the track if you weren't too careful. So, I mean, it's a very uh, tricky track to set up. 
I, I think one of the things you should be worried about, at least uh, for me at least, is turn 13. If you hit that outside rumble strip, I can't count how many times I've been like just practicing at that at Sebring or just screwing around that I've hit that corner and or the rumble strip and spun out just because of the rumble strip. So I, I think you should just be worried about that. It, 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 make sure you don't hit that rumble strip. And if you do, very minimally touch it. It'll be interesting here. Because of the results at Road Atlanta, we've got uh, Bullen with a 10% and uh, Alex P with a 5%. And we're talking about power restriction that they must carry in the race and in qualifying. So the chances that we're going to see a pole position from either of those two, probably not that great. So I'm sorry, Kyle, what's your, your thought on Florida GP? Well, just to add on the uh, the power restriction, I'm just going to say it on Sebring especially. I mean that hurts the dry that hurts the driver's performance so much. I mean, you remember a few of the drivers from last year had power restriction in Sebring. They they some of them didn't even make the A lobby. They it's just such a hassle, and I can only imagine even with the uh, the extreme speed of the Blue and Wall Five and Two LXP Two, it's just going to be so difficult and. And uh, adding on to the the difficult turns of that track, I could probably say every single one, um, the bumping whether it's the bumpiness of turn 17 or the high bank curbs of the in the uh, the middle sector, it's it's just all around. It's going to be a really tough track, but at the same time, it's going to make for some really close racing. Yeah, I think so. I think the the I was saying I didn't expect that close of qualifying, but what I do think we'll see is an incredibly close race and there's lots of room uh as derek was saying earlier there's lots of room for overtaking here you got three long straights uh as your as your starting lap you look at at turn 16 to 17 long long straight highest speed uh on the circuit there then you go 17 you round the bend you come into turn one another long straight you're going to get real close to your top speed then you're going to duck it in turn one head up to turn two another spot where overtaking happens. If somebody messes up turn one, uh, you're going to see overtaking down into turn two, uh, or I guess that's turn three, actually. And then another straight after turn five down into turn seven. Then you got kind of single file stuff. Uh, even though you, you do have areas for overtaking and people to mess up corners, especially turn 10 or turn 13, um, you know, but but genuine overtaking spots, there's uh, they're all over the place. And it, it's going to be... I think an absolute riot to see this unfold. Um, turn seven, the hairpin, the right-hander hairpin with a chicane right after it. That's a dangerous spot because people will like to follow real close into turn seven and try and uh, outbreak their competition. Uh, particularly the Ferraris, I think, will, will be tempted to do this because they've got some of the best breaks in the game. Um same thing for turn 17. Not necessarily they're going to try and outbreak someone, but so many different lines that you, you have a lot of lines that are that are crossing over each other. And I've seen collisions right into uh, turn 17 takes out both drivers. I mean, I hope we don't see that, but I think you're going to see certainly some exciting racing uh, that that is going to be really hard to predict. Be extra extra careful going into turn seven. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've seen somebody try and outbreak their competitor, go on the left side of the track, try and take the inside of the corner, but the guy on the outside, on the left side of the track, try if if he if you're coming in and you find yourself try getting outbreaked by somebody on the right side of the track, I don't know how many times I've done it myself. A lot of times I've seen other people do it tons of times. If you just keep a cool, calm head, let him get around you if that there's so much speed you carry into that corner he's going to run wide just a little bit you can pull off an over under i've seen it happen many times there just let him go by and you could pull him back as he comes around the corner because he's going to run wider than you are and if you could keep it out left kind of touch the rumble strip with your left with the left tires of the car you could swing right across dip the two rights off on the inside of that corner and get right back around that guy yeah absolutely um we look at at uh, the pit entrance here is nothing like Road Atlanta. Road Atlanta had a really weird, um, it's one of the few tracks that has kind of a, a gotcha entrance to it where you got to be very cautious about how you come in there. And uh, But Sebring, straight entrance. So nothing to worry about here. Don't even really need to practice that. You can come in at, at full speed, no fear of danger there, or uh, 
no fear of damage on on pit entrance and it's a pretty safe pit exit as well the only thing you got to watch is that uh the racing line does practically take out those uh those cones on the the separate pit pit lane exit to uh the the actual track the the racing line rides that line real close yeah and then you get guys like you who take out the cones on purpose and ruin everything yeah and then you know the uh the other thing that's going to be real interesting is pit strategy i think will play a big role here this isn't a terribly long pit uh but what that what that means is that is that some pit strategies depending on uh tire wear and where you're at in traffic it's going to have a, a big role to play here i i think as well um so it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out and and who who really takes advantage of of the uh the pit strategy here because it's probably going to be something that's neglected by everything else or by every everybody else yeah i mean it's not i mean 35 laps here i mean it's around a 1 minute 40 43 44 second lap should be the average for mid a to top of b lobby and 35 laps for that that's is still near nearly an hour or close as close to an hour as you could get or just a bit over but pit lane like you said here is not terribly long i mean it's not like road atlanta where you could wait till the guy goes by and oh no i lost uh 5,000 feet on him and then he comes into pit and you gain all of that back i mean you're not gonna there's not that much of an advantage to press when it comes to kind of just kind of relaxing because you know you can get it back during the pits it's such a short pit here that if the guy that you're trying to chase down hustles his butt off while you're in the pits he can make up that time difference in just like two laps while you're on cold tires so i mean pit strategy is going to be key for this race yeah and that's that's exactly what i mean because you look at road atlanta you can't really play the the pit strategy game because the 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 pit lane itself takes up so much of the of the percentage of a lap time that you're not really granting yourself clean air you're like reintroducing yourself into a different group of traffic like you you can't escape the traffic there here at, at sebring with uh you know a minute and three quarters lap time and a relatively short uh pit stall it's i think it is going to play a bigger role because you can strategically insert yourself into clean air if you're watching the you know if you're watching your mini map uh if the drivers are watching their mini maps and and trying to predict where they're going to come out at pit delta somewhere around 20 seconds something like that not not even really quite that long um but if they're watching their their mini map they should be able to predict when they can come in that's going to reinsert them into uh, clean air, which is is really going to be a huge advantage here, because if you can run clean laps at Sebring, it, they, that's what's going to help you take home the checkered flag. Kyle, thoughts on on additional thoughts on Sebring? It's going to be an interesting race, honestly. You, you basically, you guys basically covered um, uh, everything that that had to be covered. I mean, the pit strategy, in my opinion, is going to be the most key point in this race. Um, if you can time your pit strategy is perfect you can gain some positions on this track i mean i had a similar experience last year with uh, rock lewis s the uh, audi vitaphone driver um we were battling for second place the whole the entire race and um you know i just planned my pit strategy as best as i could gained about a thousand feet on him and i was right up on his bumper uh come the end of the race i missed out in the second but we but it just goes to show the pit strategy you gave me so much time. And that's going to be a key uh, component to anybody's race in this. But honestly, all these um, the high bankings and the turns are really going to change the race. Um, it's gonna, I, I'm expecting there's going to be some mistakes. Hopefully there's no massive wrecks or incidents. You know, just highlight real incidents or anything. Um, I'm just really hoping for a really good race. And I think that's exactly what we're going to get at Sebring. Um, quickly, let's get this in. Mugello predictions for LBM Le Mans. Kyle, what do you think is going to happen? I'll be looking for that one because that is, well, I consider that my track. Um, thanks to the recent success I've had there. But um, it's there's some really, really, obviously, we talked about this earlier, there's some really good drivers 
in all classes now. I think there's a, a top leaderboard guy in every class now. Um, but once again, I think the uh, the most competitive class again in Magella will be the GT class, which has been so magnificent. And um, with their battles, it seems like everybody in that class is somebody to battle with. I think that's going to be the class to watch for in uh, LMP1. Um, it's going to be a real fight. You know, those twists and turns, there's no margin for error. There's no room for error at Magello, really. Uh, that track can kill you with one off. So um, I think it's going to be really tight races. I honestly couldn't predict who could win any of the classes. But um, for a further look at the uh, GTC LMPC prediction, why don't we go to uh, Derek and Brad with that? Um. I would seem to think there's going to be such a speed, dif like a time difference here between the LMPC cars and the GTs, because the GT cars are going to be running so much downforce here, and it's such a momentum and grip oriented track that they're going to be back up on lap traffic after two, maybe or three, maybe four laps into the race. And the Porsche, I mean, yeah, you can run some high downforce with it, but it is very hard to keep a rear mounted flat six from swinging out in a high momentum corner um just as the setups here for the porsche is going to be such such a pain to try and get it down because you gotta you gotta find a, a uh, more of a, a delta where you can keep your speed up in the corner but you won't sacrifice grip i mean with mazda cup and in r1 last year it is all about cornering speed here it's all about keeping your momentum up if you dip two tires off and get into the get into the kitty litter, you're pretty much your lap's ruined. You can't make it up in the next few corners. I mean, you you look at it and it's like you there's really no margin for error. You sit and you go from pretty much the front straightaway, turn one, turn two, and it's just straight cornering the entire way until you get back out onto the front straightaway. There's no break here. I mean, you get maybe one two seconds on a short little straight between corners. But there's so much effort goes into trying to keep the car on the track that it's hard to focus on being fast at the same time. You got to really find that balance. Yeah, and also, I mean, with as long as um, you're focusing on those corners, it's it's going to be especially tough for the uh, the prototypes overtaking the, the GT cars. You can only imagine how tough it's going to be. I mean, last week at Road to Atlanta, we of course it's so difficult. Um, for the prototypes to get around the GTs, there's no room, really, because they're always, you're almost always cornering, except for that those two long straightaways. And um, as you look at Magello, it's it's all like you said, uh, it's all turns, so it's going to be so tough to overtake the prototypes. But I mean, um, especially uh, the prototype battle is getting really fierce now as we enter the European stages. Uh, if you look at the the uh, the top three and LMP1 standings, so the top three teams are covered by eight points in the standings after five races. I mean, that just, it's going to be, it's going to be a really, really tough fight through this uh, second half of the season, and it's in all the classes. I mean, even Jet Motorsport uh, and Jet Motorsport Caterham, second and third in their LMPC and GCC classes, it's, they're going to be looking to get some, a lot of points at Magello, because if somebody makes a mistake and you get pounced on it, uh, there's some really valuable points waiting there for the driver who can, who can claim them. Politely, I'll disagree with you both. I think Mugello is going to be easy to pass the GTC cars, with exception of turns 6, 7, 8, and 9. Other than those, because that, that's pretty much a flat, uh, a flat out area for, for the LMPCs, because they have relatively high grip to low power, um, that that's going to be challenging to overtake there. But everywhere else, this track is about um, double corner setups. So you got turn one, which is essentially a double corner because you got the entrance and then exit of turn one. And that seems redundant to say, but truly you take it like two corners. You know, it's it's the entrance, you got to hold it, and then you got to get the right exit on turn one. Um, and, and then you got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine together. 10, 11, 12 is almost a, a two-part. 13 is is a chicane that is counted as one corner, but it, it's like this setup, you know, of a of a left right, left right, you know, or a right left. Um, eight nine is the only double right you get on the on the course, you know. So I, I think what you're going to get is right after two three up to four, you'll see the LMPCs 
able to overtake in that section. And then they only have to wait through 4-5 to be able to take up into 6th again, or up into turn 6. So you have like these little areas where they're able to overtake. Coming out of turn 9, the LMPC is going to have a ton of speed that they'll be able to overtake and outbreak into turn 10. Then it's only you only have to wait until turn 11 where you can outbreak and out accelerate them down into turn 12. You can hold higher throttle through turn 12 just like Road America going around the outside like Brad was saying earlier. And turn 13, got to be single file through there. I mean, you can take it flat out. I think even the Porsches will be able to take it flat out, but no way will you be able to overtake through there without putting somebody off into the grass. This track will be challenging because like Derek said, you can't put a wheel off. These sand traps are so deep that if you make a, a major mistake, your race is practically done. I mean, it's going to take you, you know, near a half an hour to get back to the track because the sand traps are so deep. I mean, you don't have to worry about damage. It's just your race is over. You'll lose 30 seconds, seriously, 30 seconds trying to get back on track. Um, some of these are also Forza sand. So you get out there far enough and you're going to be doing, you know, five mile an hour until you get near enough back to the track. Uh, it, it's pretty rare to actually see damage caused by the walls here um, because those sand traps are so deep but what we see a lot is this is a weird pit entrance it should be straight but it's not it's got this weird kink in it just before you enter the pits and some people go flying in there and will hit the pit wall so hopefully you don't pull an FMS Senna and hit the pit wall in there but uh, yeah unpredictable I think as to who's gonna who's gonna come out on top is high downforce going to win out at Mugello, you know, like common sense? Or is it going to be low downforce wizards that are able to tame their cars? Kyle, do you have a, uh, an announcement for us here concerning uh, LLBM? This is, I'm, I'm so excited to announce this. Um, the LLBM V8 Supercar Championship. Um, this, is a, this is the first season for the supercars. Um, you may know them. Uh, the, the famous Australian... Uh, V8 Supercar Championship from real life is just some of the best racing you could see. You get Ford versus Holden um, just pitting out together and the battle is between these two cars and the, <laughs> the beatings they could take is, is absolutely phenomenal. We, we at LBM recognized that and we thought, you know what, this is, this is, this is going to make for some really, really good racing and it's already uh, shown a really, really good fan base and popularity among LBM drivers. Um, site has been up for about a week now, and we've got 12 registered teams, 18 registered drivers in the first week. So we are just so excited about it, and being able to watch these um, these Fords and Holdens duel out, um, whether you're a super leaderboard driver or you know, middle class average drivers looking to gain some experience. It's going to be tough to drive for anybody, and we're just really looking forward to seeing some great racing. And this is going to be one of the most exciting series, in my opinion, out on Forza right now. Now, um, questions. Is it going to be, um, like a locked spec setup, or is it going to be, like, required upgrades, then you're free to tune it however you want? Well, it says on the website right now, it states the, um, the cars are being upgraded to R3-800, um, which is most likely going to be changed in the next couple of days. Um, so there's plenty of time, plenty of time, months, to prepare for this, of course. But we um, have experimented with uh, R3-800 and, um, and also keeping the PI at the same stock level, but allowing the tune setups which we found was um, the tightest racing, the most competitive racing. So, um, you know, just keep keep uh, checking the LBM V8 Supercars .com for the updates because in the next couple of days it, it should be going to stock PI with tuning setups. So just keep an eye out for that. But uh, honestly, I think no matter what the upgrades of the tuning are, this, these battles are going to be amazing. I, I cannot wait for this. He's got 10 races on the calendar. runs from April to uh, June right now, middle of June. So beginning April to middle of June, uh, 10 races on the calendar. The race distances right now, they're still trying to work out exactly what's the right formula for it, but this is really an exciting thing when you get uh, either Formula Forza or LLBM, our partners, uh, launching a new series 
you know it's going to be populated with with some of the most competitive guys out there and for the guys that that are uh, you know just r1 sticklers this may be your chance to step in and and capture some of the glory in an r3 spec you know so this is going to be um for those guys that that don't like to step down in in pi or, or go down to the the lower race classes this is still going to be this is still going to feel like a lot of power and <laughs> that's kind of the, the beauty of these v8s is lots of power not a ton of grip but you still get some great racing very sturdy cars these before we take off let's do a final thoughts on on the upcoming formula forza race final thought on sebring uh i'm i'm gonna say that uh expect expect pull from fms senna that's that's my my final thought on this he's been nursing a, a broken finger so he, maybe he's been performing under where he's at he's ninth in the standings right now i think I, I expect an explosive uh result from him possibly even the win here at, at sebring uh provided he you know he doesn't have a race incident or something like that derek final thoughts it is it is all going to come down to the setup for sebring i mean you're going to get the guys up front senna uh ace is wild all the guys with the big power cars the audis um all the cars with tons of horsepower and tons of torque they're going to be running low downforce for sebring and then you're going to get the cars like the ferraris the aston martin well not so much the aston martin that's more of a power car but like the acuras the even maybe even the mazda you're going to get people running higher downforce setups to try and capitalize for the slow bits of the course because i mean there's so like we said earlier there's so much variety that you can pretty much almost run whatever setup you want, and you will still be competitive. Brad, final thoughts. What do you What do you think, Sebring? My whole thing here is practice, practice, practice. There's so many spots on this track where you can screw up and lose so much time, or and there's spots where you can uh, get it right and gain a lot of time. So just keep on practicing, even through Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Practice, practice, practice. Get as many as much time on the track as possible so where when you get to the race and there's other cars around you you know what to do and you know not how to screw up and how to do well couldn't agree more kyle final thoughts sebring what do you think well i think you you took the words right away from me fms son for pole in my opinion but after that uh the race is totally open i mean <laughs> i'm out of the running for pole that toyota is just absolutely terrible on sebring but um I think it's it's just gonna be it's gonna be really tight. Um, I think Drake Hellspun and FMS Center personally, I don't think they'll be able to just run away with it uh, too easily. As everyone knows, they are the top two drivers in this race because of the blue and wall and Alex P being restricted. But I don't think they'll run away with it that easily. Um, I'm gonna I'm you should be expecting uh, some of the middle teams, you know, like XBR and um, Serpent Racing and maybe even LLBM. <laughs> Uh, to uh, get up in, in that battle too, and I just think it's gonna be, it's gonna be an awesome race, and I I couldn't honestly decide between Senna and uh, Drake for the win. It's gonna be tight. Yeah, it'll be a surprising podium for sure. All right, well, Kyle, thanks for joining us as our as our guest host here, and uh, as we sign off here, we hope to see uh, you know some some great action here at the Florida GP this coming weekend. Be sure that if you're a driver, you get in there early, qualify. Uh, try and snag that first poll so you show up in the uh, in the article, and uh, you know good luck to all the drivers and and teams out there. And if you're a if you're a fan, stay tuned. We've got a lot of content coming in the next few days. So, thanks for listening. Goodbye, boys and girls. Thanks, guys. Easy. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Dude, you know clutch popping's illegal, right? So? <laughs>